I believe that limited government is not a political position. It is an American tradition, an American invention, and American virtue. And in my time today, I want to make the case for that proposition, or make a case for that proposition. And in doing so, you might be interested to know my witnesses are not conservative political pundits. They are a fifth century canonized churchman, already mentioned, Augustine, two Democrat Party presidents, one from the 19th century, one from the 20th century, a famous Unitarian transcendentalist, excerpts from the ACLU's official position statement, selections from the Libertarian Party platform, and a Nobel laureate economist. I've thrown in some information from the Cato Institute and a few quotes from two obscure contributors to Menza magazine, but only for added flavor. I can win any argument on any topic at any time against anyone. People know this and steer clear of me at parties. Often, as a sign of their great respect, they don't even invite me at all. <laughs> well, I'm very honored to have been invited to attend this party and make a case for limited government. State and local government spending has increased two and a half times faster than the growth of our economy since 1900. Federal non-military spending has increased nine times faster than the economy has grown. And the percentage of our economy that's government controlled is now nearly twice what it was when I was born. 1953, if you're in on the pool, is the winning year. And nearly five times that of what it was in 1900. Since 1990 alone, federal spending, federal government spending, has increased from $1.3 trillion to $2.78 trillion. That's more than doubling. How many of you doubled your income in that period of time? And the rate of increase each year is going faster and faster. 2.1 percent of all people that have a job work for the federal government. Doesn't sound so bad, but 3.4 percent work for state governments and 10.4 percent work for local governments. That means one in six people who work work for the government at some level. And federal government employment numbers are expected to grow at 2 percent or more over the next decade. State and local government, 11 percent or more over the next decade. Big government doesn't just exist in Washington, D.C. It resides in state capitals, county offices, special district boardrooms, city hall. Doesn't this school know that? Government at all levels imposes taxes to fund its operations, in case you didn't know. The government doesn't have any money. It has our money. Not just federal income tax, but state income tax, sales tax, real property tax, licenses, permits, user fees, school fees are all taxes. According to the Tax Freedom Foundation, Tax Freedom Day for the average working person, that's the $40,000 a year person, was April 30th this year. That means one third of the average working person's income went to government. For some people, it's more than 60%. For me, last year, Tax Freedom Day was July 5th, and I'm not a wealthy person. Money spent by government is money that the earner cannot spend as he or she may wish. The earner cannot spend that money on education or charity or investment to support their church or other institutions they choose. Nobel laureate Milton Friedman noted in an interview on PBS more than 30 years ago, remember that, that it is impossible to do good with other people's money. He observed that one doesn't spend other people's money as carefully as you spend your own. He opines that government, 1972, has grown out of all proportion to its purpose and to its legitimate roles. That indictment was voiced more than 30 years ago. Not yesterday, not just when a party that maybe I don't like or you don't like took over Congress or government, more than 30 years ago. Writer and lecturer Douglas Dunn, in his online essay, it's in the bibliography, The Role of Limited Government in Free Society, writes that the appropriate role of limited government, as described by Professor Mallinson so eloquently, 
needs to be defined. The role of limited government in free society is to settle disputes and maintain the public order. That's it. The government does not have any business intruding into people's personal lives or any behavior or belief that does not affect other people absent their free and voluntary consent. Individuals should be free to make personal economic decisions. Government regulation should afford the least possible intrusion in order to protect public safety and order. Mr. Dunn recognizes the need for reasonable regulations, things like, oh, I don't know, stop signs, the Uniform Commercial Code, and basic criminal laws. But he is concerned that there are some in our country who want government to regulate private choices, to regulate sexual morals, or impose public policies about prayer or worship in public settings, yet those same groups want the government off our backs on matters of public policy about the economy or how employers treat their workers. You see, there's some things that government does that we might agree with and that agree with our view of what is right and some things that we disagree with. If we advocate for limited government, integrity demands that we will lose not only what we don't like about government, but also some actions and some regulations that we might embrace or endorse. On this point, I think it's instructive to review part of the Libertarian Party's national platform. In pertinent part, it reads as follows. Quoting now, I'll tell you when I stop. And here's a good place for a disclaimer. The opinions and statements expressed by this speaker do not necessarily reflect those of the rest of the panel, although they should. <laughs> We believe, the Libertarian Party platform, in pertinent part, and I quote, we believe that respect for the individual's rights is the essential precondition of a, for a free and prosperous world. Can I get amen? amen? That force and fraud must be banished from human relationships and only through freedom can peace and prosperity be realized. We defend each person's right to engage in any activity that is peaceful and honest and welcome the diversity that freedom brings. The world we seek to build is one where individuals are free to follow their own dreams in their own ways without interference from government or any authoritarian power. Continuing, we challenge the culture of the omnipotent state. Now that is Jeff's, come on, amen. We challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of the individual. We oppose all interference by government in areas of voluntary and contractual relations among individuals. Personal responsibility is discouraged by government denying individuals the opportunity to exercise it. In fact, the denial of freedom fosters irresponsibility. More on that later. The, the party states that current problems in such areas as energy, pollution, health care delivery, decaying cities and poverty are not solved but are primarily caused by government. Editing a little more, end of quote. Most limited government, conservative, free market, fundamental evangelicals, how's that for a string of adjectives? Can cheer every one of those clauses. However, the Libertarian Party, because of its particular view of limited government, also opposes any pornography laws. They oppose any limitations on abortion, condemn parents who want to force their children to conform to a religious view at any age. Interesting concept. They support gay marriage, gun rights, oppose the draft, would eliminate all drug laws, and think prostitution should be legal. If it is any consolation to those of you who are would-be libertarians or actually have your party card, we should note that the party also wants to secure our nation's borders. In his musings on the Second Amendment in a brief article in the 2007 Mensa Bulletin, did any of you uh, see that? No. No men's a bulletin receivers. You can borrow mine. <laughs> Michael Cutts writes, quote, I recently came across an enlightened bit of wisdom. Now, this is serious stuff here because we get away from politics and we get to the, to the be careful what you wish for part of my presentation. I recently came across an enlightened bit of wisdom. Anyone who belongs to the ACLU should also belong to the NRA and vice versa. After all, both groups support civil rights and these rights are not pick and choose. Either you support the Bill of Rights or you don't. Checks in the mail. No, oh, sorry. I heard a phone ring and 
That's usually the response. Okay, similarly, it could be said you either support limited government or you don't. In making the case for limited government, we make the case for limiting government intrusion regardless of who's running the government. And the role of government should be limited regardless of what political group or coalition is in power at any given time. But that's not really a problem for me. Because people who subscribe to my fundamental faith, who share my conservative, very conservative, I'll just let you know who's talking here, political, social, and economic views, or who agree with me in most things, are not a majority or likely to ever be a majority. They're not the ones who are likely to be in control of government. And on that premise, I want to turn to the first and best case for limited government of four that I want to give you. You've already been introduced to St. August Augustine. I've been saying Augustine, and then Professor Mallinson has said, well, it depends how, how, is it either cerebral or academic you are. I first met Augustine in an old song, Octuliber Augustine, and we all know that the name is Augustine, but we'll say Augustine <laughs> because I'm not in charge. In the bibliography, you're, t you're pointed to an essay by Linda Rader titled Augustine and the Case for Self-Government which is sort of the cliff notes to the book, The City of God. Augustine wrote that treatise to explain Christianity's relationship with complete, competing religions and philosophies and its relationship to the Roman government with which the church was getting inextricably intertwined. It was written soon after Rome was sacked by the Visigoths in, I believe, 410. I read that in a book in Mallinson's office. Despite Christianity's designation as the official religion of the empire, Augustine declared its message, get this, to be spiritual rather than political. How radical. That Christianity should be concerned with spiritual rather than political. Christianity, he argued, should be concerned with the mystical heavenly city of Jerusalem rather than earthly politics. Many think his theology supported and helped define separation of church and state characterized in later Western European politics and many don't. His book presents human history as a conflict between what he calls the city of God and the city of man. The city of God is marked by people who forgo earthly pleasures and dedicate themselves to the promotion of Christian values. The city of man consists of people who've strayed from the city of God. <laughs> Augustine opposed political or governmental action as a means of either individual or social improvement. He rejected the platonic view of the state as the ultimate achievement of humankind. His allegiance was higher. It was, as Professor Mallinson tells us, to God alone. He noted that political authority is by nature coercive, and while essential to society, the fact that we need political authority doesn't make it noble or even praiseworthy, just necessary. I'm a cancer survivor. You can congratulate me. I'm seven years clean last week. I have bladder cancer. Once a year, I have to have a medical procedure done called a cystoscopy. If you don't know what that is, you don't want to know. Just envisioning yourself having a colonoscopy in a much less roomy enclosure. <laughs> That procedure is necessary, but it is not noble, and it certainly is not praiseworthy. You might say government is like a cystoscopy. Necessary, yes, but that doesn't make it noble or praiseworthy. And as Jeff told us, it came into existence because of man's fallen state. So I'm going to skip ahead. Government and law, according to Augustine, exist to intimidate and to restrain those who would do evil so that good may live. That is its proper function. At least to some degree, live in peace and order. Unfortunately for us, good and evil are no longer defined by traditional Judeo-Christian values. They are defined by group, groups or a group who reject traditional values and often have none of their own. If you don't think that's a valid statement, how many of you think it's traditional Judeo-Christian values to provide birth control pills to 11-year-old girls without consent of their parents through a public school in a conservative state? Only to have the Denver School Board look at that and say, hey, we can do that too. The definition of good and evil by those in power is the first case for saying let's limit what they can do. 
And that was Augustine's argument in the city of God. In the fifth century, he, he gives us a little bit more detail and, and, and than I could understand, and so I'm going to rewrite it this way. The city of God and the city of man exist. The city of man is populated by, in our term, secular humanists, and the city of God is populated by believers. The city of man is always much larger than the city of God and has a much different view than what the city of God has concerning good and evil, what is acceptable, what is sacred, what is profane, or whether they even exist. Accordingly, city of God people should not want city of man people making any more rules than are necessary to carry out the few values shared by the two camps. And he said those values are peace, tranquility, and order. I would add equal justice under law and at the least neutral courts for resolution of disputes. Ms. Rader's comment on Augustine is that there can be no genuine common agreement upon which earthly government is based because the diversity in values and perspectives in our contemporary society preclude that. Fifty years ago, it really didn't matter too much who got elected president or who got elected to Congress because the views of people weren't that different and they were all like the views of my mom and dad. They really were. Shockingly enough, when you're bored and have uh, time, read about five or six John F. Kennedy speeches on the economy and on social issues and then read five or six Reagan speeches. And you know what you're going to find? They're the same. President Bill's nodding his head. That's so good, because I walked in here and I saw this fruit. And last night I watched Shakespeare in Love and I thought, oh, I didn't know they were giving people fruit to throw at the presenters. <laughs> but I want you all to know that the president just nodded his head in agreement with me, so just keep your banana peels to yourselves. Thank you very much. All right, sorry. I didn't mean to digress. The commonality or shared values needed for support of government is very basic. The necessaries of life, peaceful coexistence, and freedom to be left alone. Augustine would agree with Edmund Burke that the great use of government is his restraint. And the most important thing to do with government is restrain. Centuries ago, Augustine observed the classical view of politics as faulty. Even his view of shared universal values may also be inaccurate today. I wonder if there's a shared value even of peace, of national unity or neighborhood amity. With such diverse perceptions of what is right and good, diverse perceptions of even what words mean can be a source of conflict. Do we remember? It depends upon what is, is. Maybe we don't. There are those who believe government is a proper means of imposing a single set of values on the people it governs. There are more people like that today than ever before, and some claim to be believers. Some claim to be liberals, some claim to be conservatives, all claim to be right. They try and they fail, and Augustine tells us why. They fail because human ills of whatever nature have a spiritual cause and require a spiritual cure. Or in my words, you cannot teach people how to live until they are taught how to be alive. Augustine reminds us that governments operate not in a morally neutral world, but in a fallen world. Let me repeat that. Governments operate not in a morally neutral world, but in a fallen world. And acknowledgement of that circumstance is critical to understanding well, I believe that all believers should be proponents of limited government. And failure to acknowledge that fact is why some well-meaning, professing believers think government is the answer to social problems. My home church is also my mission field because of that same drift. If we, if we send enough cakes to the maniac of Gadara, he'll be a better person rather than dealing with the spiritual problem that causes his difficulties. August, Augustine tells us that only free-willed love engenders that reordering of the soul essential to any genuine spiritual regeneration and thus to any genuinely virtuous behavior. Growth in government and proliferation of laws, my words now, are evidence of the breakdown, not the flowering of a nation or civilization. People need to absorb the rules of society, the shared values, through a process of enculturation. 
But that doesn't happen when we have so many laws and so many rules that there can be no acculturation, no teaching of manners, no teaching of how to be polite. The need for government in a society is reduced when there are shared, non-negotiable, fundamental values and self-governing, mature, responsible, well-behaved individuals, families, and groups. And big government removes the incentives for those things through coercive means. You know it's true. You don't need to read a study. You need to listen to anybody under the age of 30, and if you're one of them, I apologize, talk. The expectation that somebody will do for them. My daughter is a graduate of the University of Colorado Boulder, Phi Beta Kappa, thank you very much, takes after me. <laughs> she got a major there in world dance and culture, and she teaches for the Colorado Ballet. She also got a degree in religious studies, and she went there to learn what other people think. She went there to learn how to deal with people that weren't like her. And she became a little like them. But her faith and her views were strengthened even more and were affirmed. I encourage us not to be afraid to lock horns with people who have different ideas because truth is stronger than non-truth. The nicest thing about telling the truth my daddy used to tell me is you don't have to remember what you said. <laughs> Write that down. Share that with somebody. It'll keep you out of trouble. When you're, t when you're introduced as having just come from a sentencing like me, you'll be able to say, it wasn't my sentencing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Augustine makes the case for limited government in this concise way. The people in government don't share our values. Some government's necessary, but it should be limited to necessities so that believers are not coerced into actions in conflict with their fundamental beliefs, nor prevented from living in conformity with their faith. That's hard to improve on that, so let's just amplify by looking at the case made by the ACLU, John Kennedy, Thomas Jefferson, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. How's the time, Captain? We've got a few minutes left. All right. It's not only conservatives in the media, government, and education that advocate for limited government, nor are their arguments or personalities always credible. Entertaining, yes. So I want to turn to what I'll call liberal icons for endorsement of limited government. According to their official website, the ACLU espouses the view that religious freedom is a fundamental right that is guaranteed by the First Amendment's free exercise and establishment clauses and encompasses not only the right to believe or not believe, but also the right to express and manifest religious beliefs. All right. These rights are fundamental and should not be subject to political process or majority votes. They go on to observe the Constitution does not endorse any religious creed, does not recognize any power of government to decide theological questions. All right. Recognizing that religion plays a prominent role in public life, the ACLU endorses an active public presence for religion, but differentiates that from an active government presence. So here's the argument. The bigger government is, the more areas into which government control or money is injected, then the more areas in which the ACLU will advocate the absence of any religious influence. How's that for an argument for limited government? If schools are government schools, God is out, but in private schools, God is in. If the government takes a dollar from you, but then gives it back to you as a grant, now it's government money, and God can't be there because that's government. You can go to the park, but not the government park. Wait a minute, all parks are government parks. Why can we have the Ten Commandments on the Supreme Court building, but we can't have them in the Texas Supreme Court building? That's government, because that was a government dollar taken from somebody and given back and told how it could be spent. So smaller government means smaller godless zones. Very simple. You might be surprised to learn the ACLU's official position also includes this tisbit. Children are free to pray in public schools as individuals or in groups. That's in their platform. Perhaps we should join just for a while and, and write notes and say, why don't we just uh, support that part of the platform? It's politics, I guess. Let's shift to John Kennedy. You might remember John Kennedy if you were born before 
for me. <laughs> Both of you. Former President John Kennedy in his inaugural address said these words, the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. John Kennedy. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, and oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. That wasn't Reagan. That wasn't Jimmy Carter the Baptist. That was John Kennedy. His challenge that each citizen of this land, quote, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country, might well be the battle cry of proponents of limited government. Kennedy closed his only inaugural address with these words. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth God's work must truly be our own. That is exactly the point. Government is not the virtue. Individual responsibility and contribution are virtuous. Kennedy made the case for limited government and called on us to serve each other, not to be served by government. Thomas Jefferson, Democrat Party icon, was elected by Congress, not popular vote. Took 30 hours of debate in the Congress and he was finally elected. Given that contentious election, it's not surprising that he gave a speech of conciliation, proclaiming in pertinent part, quote, we have yet gained little if we countenance a political intolerance as despotic, as wicked, as capable of as bitter and bloody persecutions as that religious intolerance which we recently escaped. He was arguing against political oppression and intolerance. What do you think Thomas Jefferson, the first Democrat president, would have to say about our concept of political correctness? He would probably shudder. Big government has become that political intolerance as despotic and as wicked and as capable of persecution as any government. Jefferson continues, I believe ours the strongest government on earth, the only one where every man at the call of the law would fly to the standard of the law. Sometimes it's said man cannot be trusted with the government of himself. How can then he be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels, etc., etc.? reference Mr. Mallinson's remarks. Shall we leave our people? A wise and frugal government shall restrain men from injuring each other and leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. I work till July 5 to give the government money. Everyone in this room worked till at least April 20 to give the government money and the first Democrat says that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not Rush Limbaugh. That's not Ronald Reagan. It's not even Dennis Jacobs. That's Thomas Jefferson. You see, if we're going to teach our students and if we're going to teach our children, we should have them read things that dead people wrote sometimes. You know what I'm saying? You know how much good music has been written by dead people? A bunch. But in schools today, we don't read what people said about issues today, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. It's as if all these issues were just invented. No, there's a long history, a tradition of limited government. It's not politics, it's an American tradition. Jefferson articulated the ends of government as these. The public efforts be directed honestly to the public good. Peace be cultivated. Civil and religious liberty be unassailed. Law and order be preserved. Equality of rights maintained. And everyone get to keep their own property, whether great or small, that resulted to you from your industry or that of your parents. Oh, let's nominate him. What do you say? All right. That's limited government, and Jefferson endorsed it. Ralph Waldo Emerson was a liberal, not a conservative, delivering a speech to the Phi Beta, Ka Phi Beta Kappa chapter at Harvard in 1837. This is my favorite piece of semi-academic literature. It's the essay called The American Scholar, and if you haven't read it, read it, you need to read it every day. Not every day. You need to read it on days that end with a Y. All right. <laughs> he wrote, man is not a farmer, a professor, an engineer, but he is all. Man is priest and scholar and statesman and producer and soldier. To be a person, not a thing, Emerson writes, must, we must all be scholars studying nature, studying history. 
art, literature, music, science, we must read, we must observe, and then we must act. Acting includes doing things that not only make us think, but also make us sweat and breathe hard and get dirty. We must learn and act, always bearing in mind that character is higher than intellect. Not conservative pundits, the fathers of liberal thought in this country, great libertarians who understood that we should create people that can do for themselves, that can think for themselves. That's what we must teach our students. We must create citizens who don't need much government and who can be examples to others who can do for themselves. Emerson concludes in a long quote here that I'll shorten up, that it's the chief disgrace in the world to not be an individual to not be reckoned one character, or yield the peculiar fruit which each one of us was created to bear, but rather be reckoned in the gross, the hundred, the thousand, the party, the section to which we belong. Emerson's case for limited government might be summarized this way, we don't need a lot of government. It stunts our growth. It turns us into something less than people created in the image of God. Milton Friedman would add to that that government service turns good people into less good, turns them into liars until they're converted and returned to the private sector. I'll add, because I didn't get a nod and smile on that one, but that was Milton Friedman, it wasn't me. <laughs> Let me close with Milton Friedman and then a short, a short uh, summary. Milton Friedman called himself a classic liberal, and there, the website that references him will let you watch this whole program from PBS. It's delightful, regardless of your politics. It's just delightful. If nothing else, you'll be entertained by the host's hairdo. And that, that's how you date it to 76, because you just know that's what it was. Milton Friedman called himself a classic liberal, and by that he meant he favored liberty and individual freedoms. And he was smarter than most people. He opposed big government before it was popular to do so. Government programs, he said in the 70s, should not be judged by their intentions, but by their outcomes. He observed most social programs initiated by government, if not all of them, have the opposite effect of those intended. He challenged throughout his lifetime the proponents of social government programs to name a single such program that accomplished its desired intended objective, and no one ever gave him a single one. In his thir single 30-minute PBS discussion, he argues the case for limited government most persuasively and tells us that private, voluntary, cooperative action is more effective in achieving good than any government program because it's impossible to do good with other people's money. There's another quote to put down on the refrigerator for your kindergartners to start learning early. And maybe they'll stay out of your purse when they're 10. And maybe they will um, vote for people who want to reduce taxes when they're 20. Friedman railed against the minimum wage, which he said put people out of work, didn't like public housing because there was no occupant incentive to take care of the facilities, which rapidly crumbled, and Social Security, which he called the worst investment return in the history of the planet. He abhorred the idea of people as children that need looking after by the government. Do you remember the debate in Florida in the election of 1992 where the guy in the ponytail stands up in front of the first Bush and, and Clinton and says, think of us as your children. If there was a thing right here now, I'd be physically ill just remembering that. I don't want the government to be my mother and father. The government's not a village. Even if it does take a village to raise a child, a village starts with a couple of people having children. Friedman reminds us that through the first 150 years of the history of this country's existence, government was trivial. Yet the lot of common people improved more during that period than any other time. While there are now people who live in tyranny and poverty, Friedman reminds us that's the natural state of the majority of people on earth. And it's the state of the majority of people on earth today. We are blessed in a special, unique, and really non-reproducible way in this nation. Tyranny, according to Friedman, can be from a brutal dictator, a violent horde, or by a confiscatory elected government. He also reminds us that during the 18th century, when taxes were low or non-existent, charitable giving was higher in this nation than at any other time. 
More than 30 years ago, he warned the people of this nation of the dangers of out of control, ever expanding government and called for the citizens of America to impose limits on governmental interference in their life. He was worried that we'd be reduced to serfdom. And then he said that while he feared we were on that road, he was optimistic for two ironic reasons. The first was the inefficiency of government. Friedman was relieved that government's so bad at everything it does that even though it spent 40% of the nation's wealth, it did it so poorly we could escape. We could escape, we could evade. And the second reason he was optimistic was, and I quote, the ability of the American people to circumvent the law. <laughs> I'll just leave that one there without further comment. I, after all, make a living doing just that. Friedman's case for limited government is very concise. Big government does not work. We must have limited government to avoid poverty and tyranny and to allow the producers of wealth to direct its use, which is the best way to address all social needs. The Cato Institute of Washington, D.C. proclaims in its handbook, and I'm almost done, for the 108th Congress, or I'll be done whenever Professor Mallinson tells me I'm done. Okay. States that limited government is one of the greatest accomplishments of humanity. This is a political statement, but it's well articulated. Advocates of limited government are not anti-government per se. Rather, they are hostile to concentrations of coercive power and to the arbitrary use of power against right. Close quote. Well, that's not descriptive of all proponents of limited government. Jefferson was, in fact, anti-government and took pride in contracting its size, keeping it out of issues rather than injecting the government into them. I omitted his second inaugural, where all he did was brag on all the departments of government that he had cut back. And that's in 18 ought something. It wasn't last week, last month, last year. That was like way back when. And it was a virtue to close up government departments we didn't need. I'm anti-government when its definition of right varies with mine, and so is just about everybody else on the planet. John Locke, in his second treatise on government, wrote that the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. In all the states of created beings capable of laws where there is no law, there is no freedom. Liberty is to be free from restraint and violence of others, which cannot be where there is no law. But freedom is not, as we are told, a liberty for every man to do what he lists. A liberty to dispose and order as he lists his person, action, possessions, and his whole property within the allowance of those laws under which we are, and therein, that is under law, not to be subject to arbitrary will of others, but freely follow our own. His concept is not original, but it is well stated. The purpose of government is to maintain an ordered society within which we can each deal with our bodies, our minds, our beliefs, and our possessions as we choose within the bounds of law that precludes us from acting in a way that infringes another's liberty. The type of person described by Emerson can be a citizen in a society of limited government. Jefferson's discerning mind taught to recognize truth can thrive without the need for big government. Citizens who heeds Kennedy's call can remove the need for big government. The ACLU offers us the argument that smaller government means smaller godless zones. Milton Friedman admonishes against letting the government spend too much of our money. And the Libertarian Party reminds us and confronts us with the fact that supporting limited government can lead to people doing a lot of things we don't think they should. Beyond all of these arguments and positions, St. Augustine impresses upon us that government on earth is not man's highest achievement and is no substitute for divine truth and grace. Let us bear in mind, as Augustine taught, that human ills of whatever nature have a spiritual cause and require a spiritual cure. That is the case for limited government. That is the truth we should teach. And now, I invite you to pass your question cards to the center aisles while they'll be collected as a real professor returns to the podium and does something other than rant. I'm sorry, but I actually believe this stuff, and if it shows, well, thank you very much. And thank you for letting me be here.